Well, I'd like to welcome you to our first colloquium in two and a half, maybe three years. I, one of the last ones I remember in this room, actually Ben was one of the last colloquium speakers in this room, and then um, the pandemic hit, and we've been on Zoom, or WebEx, and Zoom um, again, and it's my pleasure to kick off uh, the in-person or hybrid colloquium this year with Dr. Shauna Morrison. Shauna is from the Carnegie, Carnegie Institute for Science. Um, uh, in talking with her, I've realized we share similar commonalities at grow, um, going to a small uh, undergraduate institute in a southern state uh, for our undergraduate degrees and then moving on to a much larger PhD program uh, Shauna went, got her PhD at the University of Arizona and then started a postdoc in 2017 at Carnegie. Um, her PhD advisor was Bob Downs at Arizona. And then she, while at Arizona, she did some structural mineralogy. I looked through some of those publications um, and um, did a lot of XRD and published on that. She got involved with the Mars uh, rover. Um, uh, mission and where they had the Kim Min X, XRD on it and they actually powdered Martian samples and uh, did the mineralogy on those on Mars. She began to do mineral ecology which seems an oxymoron to me but it implies that minerals have a life cycle and are much more um, uh, valuable and interesting than just being pretty rocks that collect in museums, or pretty minerals and crystals that collect in museums. She then started looking at mineral networks, and that's about the time I started listening to your talks. And um, she does not look at mineralogy the way that I was taught mineralogy, and I, we're going to learn about some of those things today. Shauna is a research scientist at Carnegie now and has been there since 2017. And with that, I will turn it over to Shauna. Thank you. We're already recording. Awesome. Okay, fantastic. Should I make this big or can everyone see it? Or? Is that good? Okay, awesome. Thank you so much uh, for that really kind introduction. Yes, we do have a lot of commonalities. Um, we actually found out that his wife grew up where I grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia, which was kind of funny. So, um, and I was just talking to Ben about one of my favorite things about science is actually the people that you get to work with. So it's been really awesome getting to know Jim. So um, today I'm actually just going to make this small. So this is kind of far away. Right? Um, today, I am going to um, share with you uh, basically my vision um, for, for what I think is a new frontier in Earth and planetary science, and that is mineral informatics. I'm going to touch on some of the topics um, that, that Jim mentioned and introduce uh, a couple more. So, um, I'd like to talk first. Can I make this go up or no? Yes, you can make it go away. I would do that. Go click on more. And then hide floating controls. Okay, awesome. Now you guys can see all my slides. Um, so I wanted to start out by talking about um, kind of how I shifted to this. Jim mentioned that I started in really sample-based, lab-based um, crystallography and mineralogy. And I really got excited about mineral informatics and the shift into data-driven discovery as I became a part of this shift from a very descriptive mineralogical science into this more predictive realm. So we were able to, um, obviously, I think you guys know what mineralogists do. I don't know how diverse the audience is, but in general, we, we measure and we describe things that we find uh, in the field or that we create in our labs. But we can do a lot more than that. Um, so we can do things like predict the number of missing mineral species on Earth. And I'll talk a bit more about that. That's mineral ecology. Um, we can predict the location of currently unknown mineral deposits. We can um, develop 
planetary scale biosignatures and the diversity and distribution of mineral species across the planet. And we can use uh, cluster analysis to predict mineral formation environments, including whether or not there is biogenic input to that formation. So a lot of really exciting things that we can do. So essentially my vision for the future of mineralogical science um, and a huge component of earth and planetary science is that it is data driven. So we're really harnessing that predictive power that I just mentioned. It is cross disciplinary. I think a lot of the big outstanding questions in science lie at the interfaces of field. You know, it's it's geobiology. It's it's looking at the way minerals interact with the atmosphere to think about exoplanets and things like that. Um, and it's it's multidimensional. We have a lot of data out there, and and often I think we tend to I used to try and um, look at this, the smallest data set possible, right? What's the simplest system that that we can look at? But the fact is, multidimensionality is not a curse, right? We can harness that and do a lot of science with it. So this is really my vision for the future of, of Earth and planetary science. So why minerals? I probably don't need to tell everyone in this room that, although I see some, some faces that are not in, in Earth science. Hi, Vic. Um, although he knows, because he's heard me talk about this. But, um, but just in case, I'm going to say why minerals. It's, like Jim said, not just because they're pretty, although they are very pretty. Um, so definitely go to the museums and check them out. Um, but why do we want to study them um, from a mineralogical and earth and planetary science standpoint? Um, firstly, they are the oldest and most robust materials in our solar system, right? We don't have, um, you know, water samples and gas samples from the beginning of the formation of our solar system. We have minerals, so they really are our oldest record. Um, and fortunately for us, they retain uh, information about their formational conditions and any uh, subsequent weathering and alteration that they've undergone. So minerals essentially contain the story of what happened to them. And it's our job to unravel that story, to solve that puzzle and figure out what they're trying to tell us. So why data science? Um, there are a lot of different reasons, but the ones that I would like to highlight is that it's multidimensional and multivariate. I just mentioned that a little bit. Um, we can really harness the complexity of these natural systems. And that's really what initially drew me to it was I recognize that, that minerals have so much complexity and so much information, and I wanted a better way to harness that. But what I quickly realized was that it also opens up an avenue to be incredibly interdisciplinary and integrate with other fields. And what these two things combined together do, they give us a holistic systems scale view of earth and planetary science. Um, and you know, pick your, pick your favorite question and you can take this holistic view of it. So some of the questions that I'm really interested in are things like, how do planets evolve through deep time and what are the drivers um, behind their similarities and differences? I work on, on Mars, on the Curiosity Mars rover, as Jim mentioned. I wanna understand what are the similarities and differences between our planets. Um, how can we deconvolve and characterize the complex feedback systems between Earth's geosphere and biosphere? Um, I see several Enigma team meeting uh, team members here, Vic and Nathan. Um, uh, you guys are all probably all familiar with the Enigma project that Paul Falkowski is, is the PI of, so I'm really not gonna talk about that much today but that's one of the big questions that we're thinking about in the enigma project is how did earth and life co-evolve and uh, what are the mineralogical signatures of life and how can we detect them on another planet both on the sample scale and on the planetary scale and even thinking about you know what can we see on, on exoplanets and thinking about atmospheres so again, maybe we have some diverse listeners. So I'm just going to use the word mineral a lot. So I'll go ahead and define it. A mineral is a naturally occurring uh, solid with a well-defined chemical composition. Mg2SiO4 is the chemical formula for forsterite, which is the olivine end member. So that's a common rock forming mineral in, in Earth's mantle. Um, and it has a well-defined crystal structure. So there you can see that structure of olivine. So that's when I say mineral, that's what I mean. And so for the rest of my talk, what I'm going to do now is talk about some um, data-driven projects and some discoveries that we've made with those projects. I'm largely going to hit some highlights, especially in the beginning, because there is a lot of ground to cover. Um, but certainly, you know, I'm, I'm here through Friday. So if there's something that you want to dig a little bit deeper in, uh, definitely let's, let's talk about it, right? I would love to talk to you about all of these things. But I'll go into a little bit more detail on a couple of projects. So... Um, 
Mineral evolution. So many of you may be familiar with this field, um, but basically the premise is that a planet's mineralizing environments and therefore its mineralogy are different at every stage of planetary evolution and they change through time. So what this does is it provides a mineralogical framework for characterizing the way those planetary systems have changed physically, chemically, biologically, um, you know, in terms of geologic processes and so on through deep time. So I really think of a mineral evolution as kind of a framework for how we think about questions and problems. With that, we've been able to make discoveries like um, there are pulses of mineralization associated with supercontinent assembly. Uh, Earth's atmospheric oxidation is recorded in the mineral record and we can actually um, time the offset of how long it takes uh, the, the changes in the atmosphere to cycle through the surface uh, of the surface rocks, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and there is a, a strong increase in mineralization with the rise of the terrestrial biosphere. So now mineral ecology that Jim mentioned, this is really cool. So mineral evolution um, is a great story and we're really thinking about it in a very qualitative way, right? We were collecting a lot of data. It was certainly data driven, but it wasn't very quantitative. So this is where we actually start moving into a more quantitative space. So mineral ecology essentially uses the fact um, that the diversity and distribution of mineral species on Earth's surface follows a very distinct trend. That is called an LNRE or large number of rare events trend. You don't need to remember that term, <laughs> but basically what it means is that most minerals are rare and only a few are very common. So this trend is very distinct um, and we can quantify it. And this is where we're borrowing tools from ecology. We didn't reinvent the wheel. Um, we, we borrow from others. We've been learning a lot from biology. So here we're looking at um, most, we're looking at vanadium species. This is a paper we put out in 2018, um, led by one of the postdocs in our group, Chao Liu. Um, most vanadium mineral species occur at one locality. Um, there are very few that occur at, at you know, 11. Most of them occur at five or fewer. So we can essentially map this trend and we can use accumulation curves to predict the number of missing species. How many do we think actually exist on Earth? So, in, um, so there was uh, 219 when we originally uh, did this and we predicted there were around 307. Since then, um, 62 have been discovered. Now actually this is a low estimate. Um, and we are working on ways to improve those estimates. So this is a paper that um, we put out in 2019 and we're still working on that, um, where we employed Bayesian methods. So one of the issues that we have, you'll hear the term big data um, thrown around a lot, especially when you're talking about machine learning and statistics. Well, we have the opposite problem, we have small data. Um, you know, many of you do sample-based work and we got small data, okay? We don't have, unless you're doing um, seismology or some remote sensing stuff, in general, <laughs> he, he's saying like, no, no. Um, in general, we have small amounts of data, but we want to be able to be quantitative with it, right? So that's where we're really trying to figure out small data frameworks that work well, that are robust and statistically meaningful uh, for the systems that we're trying to quantify. So this is one example of that. Um, and we were able to improve our accuracy of prediction um, from, we were originally predicting there were 6,000 mineral species on Earth. Today, there are around 56, almost 5,700 of them. So we're already really close to that estimate. Um, but we were able to say, no, it's actually probably more like 9,000. That is actually still a low estimate because it does not account for future technological advances. Um, you know, if we're able to go down to higher precision uh, with chemical measurements and things like that, we'll be able to find more mineral species. But there are at least 9,000 mineral species on Earth. So mineral network analysis. This is really where I started getting very interested in data science. and actually networks were inspired um, by a pre-Enigma meeting um, in which I saw a, a network of protein active sites from Jana Bromberg. Um, Paul put together this meeting, it was a protein boot camp, and Jana was showing these networks. And it struck me that she was showing a lot of information in a way that was really understandable. And I thought that's the exact problem that I'm having with my mineral data is I have a lot of attributes. I have a lot of dimensions to this data and I want to be able 
to see it in a way that makes sense to me, that's not a spreadsheet, that's not two-dimensional, X, Y plots. Um, and oh, this might be a way, and it turns out it is. So we have used this a lot in our preliminary visual exploration of our data, um, but there are also a lot of um, analytical and more uh, quantitative roles that this can take as well. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail about this, um, but I'll just hit again some of the highlights. So some of the things that we've discovered in mineral uh, network analysis is that there are embedded vectors. So things like age, chemistry, oxygen fugacity, um, structural complexity, things like that. And with that, we're able to recognize uh, phenomena in these trends that maybe we didn't already know existed that tell us something about the, the geologic history or, or something like that. But we're also able to predict missing values values, which is really nice when we're dealing with very sparse, you know, small, sparse, heterogeneous data, which is what we're always dealing with. So this offers the opportunity to fill in some of our sparse data. We've also been able to recognize historical punctuation events. So this is we're looking at a, an animal network and we're able to recognize mass extinctions um, and major environmental shifts. So you could also see that in the mineralogical record. And we were actually able to discover a previously unknown massive faunal turnover event in the trilobite record using this very technique. Uh, comparative planetology. Um, for the Mars and, and meteorite folks in the room, um, I'm sorry, I really don't have many results to give you on this, but <laughs> I have been putting together a uh, meteorite database on Martian minerals. So it was interesting to me that uh, there was no database of all of the Martian meteorite minerals, right? And I thought that was really strange. And, and I, wanted to, I wanted to compare what the uh, Martian networks look like versus Earth. And I had a hard time finding that data anywhere. So I'm making it myself. I have a student currently um, working on it, working closely with Arya Udri and, and some others to, to pull this together. So I don't really have any findings from that yet, but stay tuned and I will very soon. Uh, we've also been able to develop planetary scale biosignatures in the uh, diversity of mineral species and in that distribution that I was talking about earlier in which most species are rare and only a few are very common. So that's something you can see very clearly demonstrated in the network. The next project I'd like to mention again is, is very relevant for the Mars community. And um, this is a machine learning algorithm called label distribution learning. It was originally designed for facial recognition, but it was designed to be used on smaller data sets. So that was appropriate for our application. So I work on the Curiosity Mars rover, the Kemen X-ray diffraction instrument. And um, I, I realized that we could use the, the XRD data to predict the chemical composition of the minerals on Mars. There's no instrument that we have on the rover or period that can do that on a spacecraft. So in, it, on Earth, obviously we do it with mass specs and we do it with microprobes, but you can't really send a whole you know, massive room size microprobe to, uh, to space, um, but we can do it with the XRD. And uh, when I initially started doing this using basic statistical techniques, regression and so on, I was able to predict two and three component systems. So if we're looking at olivine, for instance, it's forced right phalite, um, magnesium, iron, I could tell you how much magnesium or iron there is. But for the petrologists in the room, you also want to know, is there a minor amount of calcium? Is there a minor amount of manganese? Because that tells us something about the pressure and the temperature of formation of those magmas. So it's telling us about the geologic history. We couldn't do that with like the basic statistical techniques. So that's why I had to turn to machine learning to be able to get out to, um, you know, up to about 12 components I think I've been able to, to take it out to. So we're still, um, we're still working on that. We're gonna keep making it even better. But basically we're able to um, predict major and minor chemical composition of the individual mineral phases on Mars. Um, in any future missions that utilize this technology and in Earth laboratories. So I'm really, really excited about this because basically we've gotten down to the accuracy of about a microprobe. So we have essentially, if you fly an XRD to Mars again or to the moon, we have one potentially slated for the moon. We had one slated for Venera D, which is a Russian led mission. I, I don't think NASA is going to be um, doing that anymore, unfortunately, but uh, well, you never know. Maybe we'll take one to Venus at some point. Um, but we have been able to 
Also, the Kemen instrument that's on Mars, the, the new version of this that we're going to send to the moon and that we were going to send to Venus, has a, uh, an order of magnitude higher resolution. Um, so we're definitely getting down to microprobe levels of uh, prediction with this. So essentially, when you send an XRD uh, on a spacecraft, you're basically sending a microprobe as well. So I would argue that that makes this the single most uh, important mineralogical and geological uh, instrument that is currently able to fly on a spacecraft. Um, so we're going to be putting it on a lot of missions. The next project I would like to mention is mineral association analysis. Um, and basically, association analysis employs the complex multi-correlations of mineral co-occurrence, and it uses that to predict previously unknown mineral deposits and analog environments and mineral inventories at a location of interest. So um, when I was originally making this talk, I had it said uh, that the manuscript was submitted and then I had to change it to end prep because I'm gonna do it Friday when I leave. Um, so we're, I'm about to submit this manuscript. It's ready to go. I got all the comments from co-authors. Um, but basically association analysis is a recommender system that characterizes um, the multidimensional co-occurrence relationships and creates these probabilistic models um, for unknown or future predicted occurrences. All of you are familiar with this, whether you know it or not. Um, it's what Amazon does when it tells you what you want to buy. It's what Netflix does when it tells you what you want to watch. It's how the grocers know what products to stock on their shelves and what to put near each other. So this was originally developed. Um, its original application was called market basket analysis. So it was actually developed for grocery stores um, to know what to, to buy and to what to put um, close to one another. But um, just like a grocery store wants to be able to predict uh, what its customers want to buy together, we want to be able to predict what minerals want to form together. So with this algorithm, we're able to ask questions like, where can I find a new mineral? Where can I find a previously uncharacterized Mars analog site on Earth? So if you know a mineral assemblage that, that characterizes a certain environment that you're interested in, you can go out there and find that. And to be clear, this is not just querying a database to say, okay, do these five minerals exist, right? No, this is looking at a database and saying, where do maybe two of those minerals exist? And it's very likely that three of the others exist there, but we don't already know it. Um, so uh, this is more advanced than just querying the database. Um, okay, and then what is a mineral inventory at a location? We can do that as well. So I'll give you some examples of these. Um, this is what the association rules look like. I'm not gonna go into all the details, but we have um, various probabilistic uh, metrics for assessing how likely something is. And these are things like support and confidence and lift, but basically they just mean how likely is this occur to occur at that location. So this is what these rules look like. Um, you know, if you have calcite, pyrite, quartz, and sphalerite, you have a certain likelihood that calcopyrite will also be there. And so we can do things like, um, Again, we're talking a lot about Mars. Um, so this is a, uh, the Tacopa Basin is a Mars analog site. And we know there to be certain mineralogy there. This has been studied extensively by the, um, when they were testing out the Pixel instrument and a couple of the other instruments for the Perseverance rover. Um, they looked in this area, but there are probably a lot of other minerals that exist there that we don't already know. And that may have some implications for what else we expect to find on Mars. It may not, right? It, they're different planets, but it may. Um, so these are the minerals that we predict are likely to also occur at this location that are not currently known to be there. And it's particularly interesting because some of these, like um, pyrite, magnetite, gypsum, things like that, are associated um, sometimes with biological processes. So that makes it, you know, okay, maybe we want to go there and sample some of these and see exactly what was going on geologically uh, to better understand what was happening. Again, they're two different planets, so maybe, maybe not, but... Um, I work with uh, some folks that do uranium mineralogy. So uh, Peter Burns, I think uh, several folks in here know Peter Burns well. And he's really interested in uranium mineralogy for, for many reasons, but one of them is looking at uh, the geology. So we were interested in finding places where um, you could study the oxidation uh, hydration alteration of uraninite. So Peter says, hey, where can, I, where can I go that I don't already know, right? So we were able to um, predict several locations. Um, you don't need to read all of that, but you can see, you know, it's, what is that, 15, 20 different locations we've been able to predict. And if you notice, 
This last column here is whether or not that was ground truth. So we made these predictions about a year and a half ago, and many of them, the ones that I've highlighted in red, we have actually been able to um, ground truth the fact that it is there. So it's not often um, that we get to make predictions and ground truth them so quickly and actually find out that we're right so fast. And that was, so that was really nice and very validating to see, um, yeah, this method works and, and we, are, we are making that happen. Um, so critical minerals, that's something that, you know, if you follow any of the USGS newsletters or if you live in society, um, you care about, right? So um, I specifically chose to look at rare earth element minerals um, and lithium bearing phases. So I focused on um, monazite, CE, and spodumene, a few others, but I'm just going to show those here. Um, and we were able to predict several uh, different locations for the, this uh, REE ore and uh, spodumene. Uh, which is the lithium bearing phase. And you can see uh, several of these have already been ground truthed just in the year and a half that we've been able to do this. So it's been really fantastic um, to, to show, okay, yeah, we're actually making predictions here. So um, USGS has been really interested in, in this, of course, in terms of making better critical uh, mineral predictions. If you guys have ever read those reports, they like to try to estimate what we, what we have out there. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to what is really kind of a two component project. And this is really the last project that I'm going to discuss. Um, but it's the longest, so strap in, don't think you're done yet. Um, and that is the evolutionary system of mineralogy. And I really feel that everything that I've talked to you about and, and everything that I haven't talked to you about um, in my career has really been leading up to this point. I feel that this is really the bringing together of the the different way of thinking about mineralogy. So this is something I've been working closely with, with Bob Hazen on, um, and that is the evolutionary system of mineralogy. I've already hinted at it several times, but minerals are incredibly information rich. And when we think of them just in terms of their idealized end member composition or their idealized perfect structure, we're throwing away a lot of very valuable information that can tell us about the geologic context and can tell us about the planetary context, the biological context, and so on. So I don't want to throw that out. I want to bring it all in, or most of it in. Um, so basically, I want to integrate these data and gain this holistic perspective of these materials and how they have changed through time and what that means uh, for our planetary evolution. So the first aspect of this project, there are many, but I'm just going to focus on two. And the first one I'm going to focus on is really asking the question of what are the modes of mineralization throughout our solar system and through deep time, which is a big question. Um, I think this is also one of those questions that, you know, people will say, okay, so what are all the ways in which minerals form? And I think people who are outside of mineralogy, that's kind of a normal question to ask, but there is no place that you can go and answer that question. So we wanted to answer that question. And we also wanted to understand what is that relationship to the geologic, geochemical, and biological uh, parameters that, that make up those environments, right? So how do we do this? Um, it was a huge undertaking, as you might imagine. Um, so we surveyed the, mode, uh, the modes of formation, all of the formational environments, we call them paragenetic modes, of the almost 5,700 mineral species. So this took, you know, a few minutes, um, and we were able to identify about 57 different modes, um, and we arranged them more or less chronologically. I'd also like to point out that this is very much a living system, and you know, just in the last week, I've I've updated it, right? So this is really meant to be a framework for thinking um, and and growing outward. Um, so this isn't meant to be fully definitive, right? This is going to keep growing, but that's where we are right now: is 57 different modes of formation, and we've arranged them, you know, more or less through time. With this, we've identified 11,000 uh, combinations of mineral and paragenetic mode. So it's a big data set. This paper came out in July. Um, so the data set is in the supplement there if you'd like it. Um, also, you can email me and I can send it to you. It's a rather large data file. It's also on the rough project uh, database. So that's rough.info forward slash IMA. You can see these um, tags here. If you look under paragenetic mode, you can see all of the different 
tags there. Um, so if you're interested in you know, minerals that form in hydrothermal metal deposits, you just click this and it'll give you the whole list of minerals that are associated with that. Um, I'm not, I, I would like to give the caveat, I'm not going through all of the data resources. I have slides on them at the end if we have time or if someone wants to see them, but you know, email me if there's something that, that you'd like to know where it is. Um, so we put together this huge data file and we wanted to think about how we can um, visualize and explore and characterize these data. Generally in our workflow, one of the first steps is to visualize this as a network, of course. Um, so I'm, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go into all of the details here, but essentially what you're seeing is a graphical representation of the relationship between all known mineral species and their formational environments on Earth and other planetary bodies in our solar system. This goes all the way back. Um, so there are 57 paragenetic modes here and they are colored by groups. We group them into 11 groups, which you can see here uh, on this legend. So each of these colored nodes here represents a certain paragenetic mode. So this is what we call a bipartite network. We have two different types of nodes. So we have those colored paragenetic modes and then we have uh, the almost 5,700 mineral species, which are represented by those brown nodes. So if you see a link between a brown node and a colored node, that means that that mineral forms in that environment. So you can see there are several minerals, um, like here, I think these are hydrothermal metal deposits, if I'm looking, uh, those are primary Hadean minerals. Um, no, high temperature alteration. I made my colors too close, look at that. Um, <laughs> these, yes, yeah, so I was right, this is high temperature alteration. So many of these form only in this one environment, but you'll see so for instance, these minerals, they form in two different environments, right? So that's kind of what's going on in the network. These are fully interactive, and I have a bunch of other slides that go into a lot more detail. So if you're ever interested in playing around with this, um, let me know. I'm working on that paper now, so it's not out yet, but I'd be happy to send you the, the interactive files and stuff. Um, so I just wanted to highlight some of the key findings that we were able to make from this work um, without going into too much detail. And they're related to water, paragenetic diversity, rare elements, and of course, biology. So water, 80% of the known mineral species formed by processes that are either driven by or associated with water, right? So this doesn't necessarily mean they have water in their structure, but some process related to water formed it. And you can, you can really see, I didn't have to put up the 80% number there, right? You can tell just by looking at this network those are all of the modes of formation that are associated with water. So you can tell immediately that it's incredibly high and that water plays a huge role, um, which we might have guessed, but it was really nice to be able to put some hard numbers to that. Um, paragenetic diversity. So this is the diversity of the formational environments. Most mineral species have only one or two modes of formation. So 59% have only one way that they form, and you're seeing that there in the network, that's most of them. And 24% um, have only, have exactly two. Um, and you can see kind of the different stru network structures uh, that are associated with those relationships. Um, that's not true of all of them. So you've got things like pyrite, um, which I have 21, but last week I actually found 22. So it forms in 22 different ways. Um, I, I'll update that. <laughs> um, and I also just, you know, the pretty mineral thing. I also just really like the pretty mineral. So of course I'm throwing up some pictures of pyrite. But pyrite forms in 22 different environments. Um, so it is, it is very diverse. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about why I care about pyrite and why that's important. But basically, when you find pyrite, it can form in a lot of different ways. So rare elements and their association with mineral diversity. So 40% of minerals require one or more rare element. Um, so these are not, not just rare earth elements, which I think is commonly a confusion, but they're things like PGEs and, and so on. And these 42 rare elements, um, they make up less than <laughs> one ten thousandths of the crustal atom. So they're very, very rare. They are not contributing a lot, um, but, they are concentrated by things like agpaitic rocks and you know these these highly evolved magmas and things like that they're also concentrated by biological processes um, and so they make a lot of different mineral species so concentrations of rare elements equals rare minerals equals high mineral diversity so 
the rare elements are very intrinsically related to the high uh, mineral diversity we see on Earth. And then last, but certainly not least, is the biosphere. So 50% of minerals are mediated by life, and 34% of those form exclusively through biotic processes. And it's interesting from a network structure standpoint, they really um, all cluster together there on that one end. And if you notice the rare elements, there are also a lot of um, rare element minerals that are forming in that area too. Um, so we are just beginning to explore this, but we are able to, in a more concrete way say life plays a huge role in shaping our planet's mineralogy and that can help inform some of the biosignatures that we use when we look at other planets. So now we're on to the second component of this evolutionary system of mineralogy um, which is a little more getting into the nitty-gritty and basically what I want to do here is predict those formational environments. If I find a mineral specimen on Mars say it's pyrite, which is the example I'm about to give you, um, I want to know how did it form, right? I want to know, is it a sedimentary pyrite? Was it associated with a VMS deposit or whatever? Probably not on Mars, but you know, I, I want to know how did it form and was there any biological input to that? So that's really the driving question behind this work. And um, so as I, as promised, pyrite is the example for that. And what we were able to do was um, put together a huge data set. Um, and this is coming from Ross Large at the University of Tasmania. So this is done on, I think one or two instruments. So there, the level of um, precision of this data set is really incredible. It's about 6,000 um, chemical analyses of pyrite. So there aren't many data sets that exist like this. This is kind of the gold standard. Um, so it's a uh, major, minor, uh, trace element, uh, geochemistry, isotopes, and we're able to um, do what is called cluster analysis. So we're basically looking at not just the XY correlations, but we're looking at correlations across all of these elements, right? So we're looking at these very multi-dimensional correlations. This is what uh, the cluster analysis results look like if we project them into PCA space. Um, and basically, what we were able to do is initially, pyrite itself has a very strong signature associated with the temperature of formation. So we can see a low temperature and high temperature groups very, very clearly. And then we can cluster further to actually be able to parse out, okay, which of those low temperature environments and which of those high temperature environments. So basically, where it stands right now, if I find a pyrite on Mars, we bring it back with sample return, which is going to happen soon, um, we will be able to say how did that pyrite form. And what I really would like to be able to answer, and I can't quite answer it yet, although we're working on that, um, is was there or was there not biological input into that formation? And this is the way that we will answer that question. So you might notice a familiar face. Um, the next, uh, I'm just going to mention one other uh, natural kind clustering project. Um, and this was really the brainchild of Alex Ostrovahova, who has joined your department as a PhD student working with Catherine. Um, and I've worked with Alex uh, for several years. She's brilliant. Please get to know her. Um, and she's also a wonderful person. So she's fantastic to work with. Um, and you guys stole her away from me. So, you know. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. She wanted to do a PhD. We're not a degree granting institution. I will forgive you. Um, <laughs> but I'm still going to work with her. Let's be clear about that. So um, basically, uh, Alex uh, has really, you know, I've worked on a lot of sample based stuff, but I hadn't really worked in meteorites. So there was something that I was always interested in getting into, but I, I just really hadn't quite toe dipped into that world. There's a lot to know. Um, so Alex has really been helping broaden my horizons. And she's very interested in chondrites. She's been working on them for several years. And um, so she's been teaching me a lot about chondrites and putting up with my sometimes not so good questions, <laughs> but um, I've learned a lot. And basically the premise here was that there are um, several different types of chondrites and they are, so that's, that's the subtype here. And they're associated with certain parent bodies or certain asteroids, they're thought to be. And most chondrites, um, 99.3, yeah, no, 99.93% um, of them are classified. 
But there's this very small percentage called the ungrouped chondrites that are not known to fit very clearly in this designation. And so Alex's question was, why? Why don't they fit? Is it that perhaps we're not thinking of the chondrite system in a holistic enough way? So thinking about this, you know, let's look at all of the trace elements and isotopes that we possibly can. Can we look at it in this more holistic manner? And when we do, we find that, hey, actually they are related to, you know, several of these in here. Or is it that perhaps they really are different and they do represent different parent bodies, which is probably the more exciting of the two, right? Because then it means, oh, now we can learn something about a different parent body. Um, but either way, it's really important to understand what these are. So um, we had an intern this summer working with us, uh, Maura Clark uh, at UMD, and she helped us put together a database of ungrouped chondrite data to go with the database that Alex has assembled of overall chondrites. Um, and so we were able to, for the 54 ungrouped chondrites, we have 451 analyses of major trace uh, elements and isotopes. So I would love to have a slide that's like, boom, here's the result. But you know, we just finished putting the data set together a month ago, so I don't have results yet, but we will soon. So at the end of the month, we're hopefully gonna have a meeting to, to move this forward. So um, I'm really excited to see what, what the answer is. You know, are these actually related to the um, existing parent bodies or, or are they something entirely different? Uh, we're doing these natural kind clustering projects on a lot of other data systems. So um, some of the papers are already out, like the silicon carbide pre-solar grains. Um, you can check that out. Um, but we have projects going on in a lot of other systems. So busy, busy. And really, you can do this in any mineralogical system of interest. Obviously, I'm focusing on things that are really related to Mars um, and in biosignatures, but you could really do this for any process that you're interested in. And ultimately, you know, I hope to do this for all of mineralogy. I don't, I won't be alive long enough for that, but you know, that's the goal. So um, I said a lot of things. So I just wanted to uh, just summarize some of those findings and really drive home um, the, the power of, of this predictive methodology. So um, we discovered that a planet's evolution is recorded in its mineralogy. We have predicted the number of missing mineral species on Earth. We have observed higher dimensional trends embedded in network topologies. Um, we've estimated complex chemistry of minerals on Mars. We predicted new locations of minerals and deposits and environments and mineral inventories. Um, we have characterized all mineralizing environments throughout our solar system and time. And we've quantified the role of water, uh, life, and rare elements within mineralogy. And we have predicted the formational conditions of minerals based on geochemistry, namely pyrite and um, silicon carbide, still working on the ungrouped chondrites. So basically, I think mineralogical frameworks offer the opportunity to explore limitless questions within Earth and planetary science, um, especially at the interface of, of geo and bio, right? And think about a geo-bio coevolution through deep time. And I just want to end with basically what I started with, which is that I think the future of mineralogy and a huge component of Earth and planetary science is data-driven, cross-disciplinary, and multidimensional. And with that, I'd like to thank you all so much for listening. And um, I'd like to thank my funders and my many collaborators who I did not put up here, um, but I really should give um, them credit. Ani Rude Prabhu is amazing uh, data scientist I work very closely with, um, Bob Hazen and, and many, and the Enigma team, some of which are here. Um, and of course, you know, the many funding agencies. And my website's up there and my email's up there. So if you have any data you'd like me to send to you, uh, just let me know. And with that, hopefully we have some time for questions. Well, thank you, Shauna. Um, we've often let the graduate students or postdocs start off with the questioning. And Lauren, are you still on? My computer died. It's a mess. Oh. And if uh, monitor online to see if anybody is asking questions online. Thank you. I can probably bring this pop up back down. Yes, maybe stop sharing. There we go. I can see the chat. Okay.
so can we. No, nope. okay, no questions there. Ah, Corday. Hi. That was a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Have you thought about including biological data in your association analysis? It struck me that you could very easily include you know, genetic data, or even better, where you had both mineralogical data and some uh, genetic data. Absolutely, and that is a project that we have I won't say really started, we planned, let's say. And um, so this is uh, myself and Anirudh Prabhu are working with Donato Giovanelli, who you probably know, he works with the Enigma team. Um, and we'd love to have you be involved if you would like to. So we haven't, um, we're just getting it off the ground. But yes, uh, there are limitless opportunities with these systems. Um, you know, so it's, you can think of it as, I, I think of it as like user information. The more context that you put within it, the, the higher the predictive power of it. But you can really use it to predict almost anything. Yeah, so. Okay, follow up question. Yeah. So it strikes me that, oh. the, uh, not to tear down my, my own idea, the one that I'm clearly already working on, but it strikes me that the um, sort of main difficulty in trying to apply that approach using both mineralogical data and biological data is finding data sets where you have both together. How do you Co-location is probably the single biggest problem that we have. Um, and basically we've surveyed all of the data that is available in the systems that we're working in. And we found places where we can feel pretty confident, you know, when you're looking at mid ocean ridge basalt, for instance, um, and in those systems, you know, you can feel pretty confident in the mineralogy across a relatively large range. So even if you're a little far away with your biological sampling, you can feel pretty confident in what that underlying mineralogy was. Um, although, you know, if you don't know the water chemistry, that's a whole other issue. But yeah, so co-location is the single biggest problem. Um, uh, Donato it does a lot of field work. I think he told me it was like 200 days of last year or whatever he was doing field work, which is insane. Um, but he, every time he goes and does sampling, he is sending me rock samples <laughs> and I'm doing the mineralogical analysis. They're doing gas geochemistry. They're doing water geochemistry. They're doing uh, the metagenomes. They're doing a whole suite of data. And through, um, through, the Deep Carbon Observatory is really kind of how this method of sampling got started. Um, it's kind of like spreading out to others who are doing this type of work as well. So I'm, uh, I'm on an ERC proposal where they're proposing to do exactly that, um, looking specifically at these Himalayan hot, hot spring systems. So I think this mode of, hey, let's look at the whole context is starting to catch on. Um, you know, it's expensive and it's time consuming and you don't always necessarily see the immediate value for your specific project. So I think we really need a cultural shift in, in the way we think about our data and, and their usefulness beyond our specific question, um, which, you know, data management and data stewardship is something I didn't even touch on today, but there's, that's a whole big thing. But I think we really need to see a cultural shift. And I think we're starting to see that because there's some really cool work that has been done as a result of this co-located work. And I think that's all it takes. Show people the cool stuff you can do with it and they'll start doing it. So yeah, single biggest problem. <laughs> Mark and then Catherine. Uh, does your system account for the unnatural minerals? Those that are Ooh. formed in uh, high temperature experimental labs? And do you consider them minerals? That's a, re -ask, that's. Re -ask it. Okay, yeah. Um, so basically he's asking, um, what about the synthetic minerals that are created in labs or the synthetic crystalline compounds? So basically we account for things that are considered, oh well, all right, I'm gonna finish this sentence and then I'm gonna say there are some caveats. But we account for things that are approved as minerals by the IMA, the International Mineralogical Association. So those are things that must have been found in nature. Um, so there are experiments where they're doing high pressure, high temperature experiments, and they are creating minerals that have been observed and known to occur, right? So those would be minerals. They are sometimes doing experiments where there are minerals that are hypothesized to exist, but we have never observed them. In that case, it would not be a mineral and would not be within 
the networks and things that I was just showing you. Um, there is another interesting component to that, and that is anthropogenic effects at the surface in natural environments. So for instance, um, minerals will sometimes form on mine walls that are the result of acid mine drainage and things like that. One could very easily argue that that is a man-made specimen, um, but those are considered minerals. Whereas if, if I directly made it in the lab, it's not. And so there are lots of um, caveats around what is considered a mineral when it comes to anthropogenic effects. And it's really interesting. And you can get these nomenclature people just like arguing, oh, it's really fun. It's very fun. Um, but basically in, okay, so now the caveat was within the evolutionary system of mineralogy, we do not want to limit it to these idealized end members. We do not want to limit it to the IMA system. We want to think about solid condensed phases through time. And sometimes those are minerals and sometimes those aren't minerals according to IMA. So ultimately we want to be accounting for these types of materials because they're what we find on our planet, right? Whether we made them or not. So um, amorphous materials are also a big issue with this. So on Mars, we find that sometimes up to, it's between 30 and 70% of all of the samples that we have analyzed with Chemin have, uh, is amorphous. So that is not considered a mineral by IMA standards. Um, there are a few things that are amorphous that are right, like opal is mostly amorphous and that's considered a mineral. Um, mercury <laughs> is liquid, but, um, but in general, they're not treated by the IMA and um, they're particularly problematic because they're very hard to study. They don't, they lack that long range order. So using techniques like X-ray diffraction doesn't work. You can do some neutron diffraction and some PDF things, so, but they're, they're really hard to study, but they're incredibly important. And on Mars, they are likely the product of, you know, alteration and things that have happened through deep time, um, whether it's aqueous alteration or it's a bombardment by solar radiation and things like that. Um, so it's really important to understand those materials. So those things, not minerals by IMA, but they're minerals to us. <laughs> um, so we'll be incorporating those. Yeah. So that's a great question. I love that question. Hi. This is fascinating. And Thank you. It's got such potential um, across disciplines, and Thank some you. of that potential is already re being reached, which is really, really good to see so early on. I, um, my question relates to something I don't think I understand, and that is, how do you know that the relationships that you're seeing, like the errors that can come up in data, are being adequately addressed, and that your insights are valid? It's not just kind of going down a rabbit hole. What's the process behind that? Yeah, so it's really important to understand that with these networks, we're looking at, you know, sometimes, well, this is like, oh, I don't even know what that is. That's 15,000 dimensional space or something like that. Um, you know, the copper network that I showed where you're seeing those trends lines is about 600 dimensional space. And it is a projection into two dimensions, or we can do it into three dimensions, which actually offers quite a bit more visibility, but it is a, it's a mathematical projection. So what you're seeing there, it's, it's important to understand that um, you have to mathematically characterize those relationships that visually is not enough. So really the visual component is for exploration. It's for recognizing, oh, hey, something funny is going on here that I didn't recognize. You know, the extinction events are a great example of that. So you see this pinch point in your data and and that makes you go oh what is that is that real and then so the the data object that this projection is built on is in 15,000 dimensional space or 600 dimensional space so that those relationships are preserved in your data object so you can characterize it mathematically right so that is the next step is is this real mathematically um, and we have a lot of a lot of folks working on um, understanding the relationship between the network topologies that we're seeing and the underlying mathematical um, relationships so that we can have a better hold on that relationship. Because right now we're saying, okay, that's cool. Now let's quantify it. But there, there are relationships there. So we're trying to better understand those. Um, but yeah, that, that's really it. It's a projection. Um, and yeah, you also have to have 
you know, you can't just sit this in front of someone who doesn't understand the data and have them say, okay, I fully understand everything that's going on in this system. You know, I, I have to be the, the mineralogist or the petrologist or the Martian scientist and say, okay, these, I'm seeing this trend likely because, so I have to understand some of the potential underlying thing. Well, I don't have to. I mean, you can do tests to basically figure out what is causing these relationships, but the way we generally do it is we come to it with some expert knowledge. That makes it go a lot faster, <laughs> right? Then you're not having to test every single thing. But, um, but Hi, yeah. Hi, Nathan. Hi. Uh, excellent talk. Thank you. I have two questions related to your mineral association uh, predictions. Yeah. So first question is, uh, you've made predictions on the localities of critical and precious minerals. Yes. And you had a uh, table showing that there's some ground truthing mm -hmm. to those predictions with field samples. Yep. Who's doing the field sampling for you? Are you doing it or, are you just, or you have a team? No, I wish. I will do some of it. Um, so it is through, um, a lot of times it's the folks at Mendat. So there's one wonderful, and she's very interesting on Twitter if any of you want to follow. It's colorful language, bear in mind. But um, she's really wonderful. Her name is Erin Delventhal. She follows me, so you can find her that way. Um, and she it, she works a lot with Minda, and she'll go out and say, okay, is this here, is that there, whatever. Um, I think she's a mineral collector, maybe economic geologist of some sort. So she's often the one who is doing that. Um, but other times it's scientific papers. You know, someone has done a scientific study uh, of the area, and then we're like, oh, okay, cool, so that's there. No, it's it's not me going out there. I wish that it was. I plan to do some of that. Ani Root is really chomping at the bit to get out there, um, but we haven't done that yet. So the second part of my question is a short one. It seems to be a very powerful tool using machine learning to predict the localities mm -hmm. of unknown, unknown localities mm -hmm. of critical minerals. Uh, are you going to patent this? Is this, uh, <laughs> you know, are, are people oh boy. in the mineral exploration industry kind of interested in this type of work? So I think the curse of like a scientist is that we're just really curious and we love to give away our incredibly valuable work for free. <laughs> So yes, this is something, um, there is a lot of interest from mining companies. There are some really cool mining companies out there also that are very forward thinking, you know, who are using machine learning, who are thinking about holistic system scale stuff. Um, and I just met some of them at a, a GRC recently, really awesome. So um, people like Kobold and, and things like that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of interest are they gonna fund in this. You know, I should I should probably get on that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they would. Yeah, so there are, there are standing offers to do things like that. Um, it's just a matter of making it happen. But yeah, there's a lot of interest in that. And I have thought about, you know, how, you know, should we make a software package that we license? Um, you know, one model is to have a contracting relationship with, uh, with the companies and things. So there are lots of different routes. Um, I've thought a lot about how to do that, um, and I don't fully know exactly how we're going to do that, but there are lots of opportunities there. Yes, I should be using this to fund my research. <laughs> Chris, um, so more sort of related to locations um, and predicting locations for certain minerals and things like that, how has NASA or any sort of space agencies um, expressed interest in using that to select future landing sites? Yeah, absolutely. The oh, um, so the question was, has NASA expressed interest in, um, in using this type of technology to predict future landing sites? Yes. Um, so I've talked with um, several program officers who have interest in, in doing that. Um, it has a lot of a lot of applications. You also, so you can do it from a landing site perspective, but it's also useful for potentially um, doing like better mineralogical mapping from remote sensing data. So that's also something that, um, that NASA is pretty interested in. So next week I'll be submitting a proposal on this. So yes. Ben. Uh, thank you, Shana. That was great. I really Thank you. It. Uh, what I was wondering, going back to one of your 
big questions that you opened with, how the ecosystem of minerals reflects and records geologic and biotic processes. I was wondering if you thought about sort of the corollary of that, which is how changing mineral ecosystems through time have shaped geologic processes. So as an example, you can think that if the population of minerals at our surface is different through time than what would be subducted in the trace element uh, evolution of the mantle, would change a lot and would be really sensitive to that. Um, so it's just one of the Absolutely. And it also, I think it applies to biology as well. So, you know, biology is, is affecting um, the, the geochemistry of these systems. But likewise, what is available to biology is also significantly affecting, or I, I think it is significantly, we think, we hope, um, it is significantly affecting um, the biological evolution as well. So yes, absolutely. What is available to the system is determining what, what rocks are forming and what processes are taking place. Absolutely, yeah. Greg. Uh, this follows on uh, Ben's pressure question. Thank you, Sean. I think you've opened our eyes and some of us newbies to... to <laughs> Thank you. I haven't really <laughs> thought of this direction before. And I've been looking at this one flashing diagram here. And do I understand it correctly? Of the 5,700 and some species that are known, they fall into about 12 categories of environmental formation. Yeah, yeah. So we we lumped them into yeah these different. I mean, you could parse them out in different ways, but though yeah, it's it's 57 overall. But you know, the nice thing about this system is you can zoom in or or zoom out at whatever level that you're interested in. So this ele grouping of 11 is kind of the the zoomed out where we're looking at you know it's it's Hadean igneous minerals, it's hydrothermal minerals, but you can also zoom in and get more specific about, you know, it's, it's a certain high temperature system, it's, you know, these um, highly evolved granite pegmatites and things like that. But likewise, you could zoom into highly evolved granite pegmatites, right? There are lots of different types of pegmatites as well. So you could also zoom in and make your own gradations within that. We haven't gone down to that level. We're kind of keeping it at this more mid or I would call the 11 grouping a higher level. Um, but yeah, it's a system that can, you can go all the way up and down, if that makes sense. There's an evolution to many of these assemblages. Uh -huh. Well, following on what Ben was asking about. Yes. Is there an Eve environment where oh. the original assembly of mineral phases in our solar system were generated and no longer can be formed? So that's a good question. And I think what this also gets at is the question of do minerals go extinct, right? Are there mineral extinction events? So not in the sense of, of biological extinction, right? Uh, you know, when a species dies off, it's gone, right? That, that genetic packet will never exist again. Um, that's not necessarily true of minerals because they form as a result of the physical and chemical conditions that they're in. But you need those physical and chemical conditions to form it. So certainly there are environments that cannot exist. So for instance, there are minerals that are formed in, you know, exploding stars. There are minerals that are formed in um, solar nebula. Uh, you're not going to get those types of that specific mineral on the surface of Earth, right? Because the conditions are just not the same. So certainly there are environments that no longer exist at this moment, but they, they could potentially. So as long as the, that process isn't entirely extinct, you could have that mineral come up again. Um, but you know, again, if, it's, if that's an environment that doesn't occur in the environment you're interested in, you're not gonna get that specific. We call them natural kinds. So diamond is a good example of that. So diamond forms in, um, you know, solar nebula and things like this. Um, but it also forms obviously in the deep mantle as well. And we argue that those are two very different types of diamond. So yeah, I can form diamond on earth in the IMA sense of an idealized structure and composition on earth and in the envelope of exploding stars. But our system argues that those are two 
different natural kinds. And you can distinguish them by their um, geochemistry, uh, by their morphology, uh, and various other attributes. Um, so yeah, you can't get that if you don't have that environment, if that, yeah. Paul, cool. um, can you unmute? And I think we can hear you. Thank you very much. Hi, Paul. Uh, Sean, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm not there today in person. I'm working no problem. on something else. But um, thank you so much. That was a great talk. I have thank uh, you. two questions. One in your, uh, your view of making minerals, obviously we have heat pressure, the acidity of oxygen, water, and so on. Do you consider light? Um, I have started thinking about light largely because of you and Nathan, <laughs> I have to admit. Um, yeah, and it's certainly something that I think about on the surface of Mars and potentially driving the processes that, that we see there. Yes, absolutely light, um, you know, photo oxidation happens. It is one of the mechanisms for mineralization. So yes, absolutely. And I, I love that work and I think it's really cool and I would like to potentially do more with you guys on that. <laughs> So we, we should talk about that because yeah. um, we can put light into uh, mineral formation uh, using, w without doing experiments actually, we can use uh, DFT, I mean, uh, calculations, mm. uh, and the, uh, the photon uh, radiation of a star, mm. whether it's G star, M star, whatever, mm -hmm. to, uh, to figure out what, what would make a change in, in minerals. So that was number one. Number two. So you have 22 now mechanisms of forming pyrite. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just going to ask you a very simple question. Is there a singular biogenic mineral that you could find on Mars that would say, okay, life was here? Is there some mineral that if you could find even rarely? Yeah, so there are phases on Earth that are certainly unambiguous guano and urine minerals, for instance, are completely unambiguous, right? Um, but, you know, you're going to find something microbial, presumably before you're going to find a bird that poops on a coal fire. So I don't <laughs> think that we're going to find urine and guano minerals on Mars. But those are, generally, those are completely unambiguous. Um, I think there are potentially some nitrogen phases that are unambiguous uh, as well. Um, but that's kind of on my to-do list is putting together the list of minerals that could possibly occur on Mars, right? We're not gonna include the urine and guano minerals. Um, and you know, we have some likelihood of finding it. Yeah, they're probably gonna be relatively rare phases, but things that you would comment more, you know, the more common phases, things like, you know, whether it's, it's calcite or pyrite or whatever, are going to be non-unique solutions, right? They're going to be ambiguous. So I, it's on my to-do list. Um, I will put that list together. So Caitlin quickly and then Bob Kopp was online. Thank you for the talk. This, is, this seems like a really powerful software. Thank um, you. Especially with like just using graph theory to predict different things. So I was wondering if you were able to input say a set of conditions like initial conditions or starting conditions like mineralogy temperature etc on a planet could you then predict the planetary mineralogy that you would expect to see so for use on like modeling exoplanets i okay so the question is basically can we use our techniques and our data to as a starting point to create models of exoplanets right um that's a wonderful question. I love that question. Uh, yes, I have not begun to do that <laughs> or, or truly given adequate thought to think about how we're gonna do that, but I know that we can. Um, and so some things that are being done, um, I'm not doing specifically, but people in material science and crystallography often use these types of techniques to try to do structure prediction, which is actually really, difficult but it's a similar it's a similar problem um and uh there it's not going super well but anyway it's you know they're making progress but it's a really hard problem um so yes absolutely uh, i think our problem might be simpler actually um and yeah so we plan we plan to do that although and i'm, I'm working with um an amazing scientist mike wong who's a currently a, oh awesome 
Oh, wonderful. Yeah, he loved CIDR. It was so great. Any of you graduate students, postdocs have the opportunity to go to CIDR, you should. It's amazing. Um, so Mike Wong is incredible. I think maybe he gave a talk for Enigma, so I hope some of you saw that. If not, please check him out. Um, he's also an incredible science communicator. He does a Star Trek podcast that is amazing. Um, I'm not really even into that, and I'm like, yes, this is so good. Um, and I shouldn't say I'm not into it. I grew up watching Star Trek. Okay, let's be clear about that. All right. The original, you know, all of them. But anyway, um, <laughs> he's, he's amazing. But he thinks about um, atmospheres yeah. of planets and he thinks about, uh, you know, exoplanet atmospheres. What I'm, what, what he and I are really interested in doing is joining the planet's mineralogy with what we're able to observe in exoplanets, which is their atmosphere. So we know that we can do that. We haven't exactly figured out how we're going to do that, um, but we know that we can. So we're, we're um, working together to eventually converge on that point, which I think is somewhat similar to what you were asking. So yes, and if you have ideas about that, I would love to talk to you. <laughs> Before we go to Bob,